The New Republic lost its capital and most of its leadership during the Hosdain Cataclysm, and despite a few holdouts and scattered forces across the Outer Rim, it no longer appears to be a major power in the galaxy. So what happened? How was the triumph of the Rebel Alliance squandered to the point where the Republic they fought to restore could disintegrate so quickly? Well, the Republic wasn't defeated in the Hosnian system or in any singular battle, but instead defeated in victory during the decades before a defeat exemplified in a series of critical mistakes. The terms of the Galactic Concordance, which officially ended the Galactic Civil War, included various provisions, banning the recruitment of stormtroopers, removing Imperial rule on Coruscant, and most importantly, forcing the Imperial Remnant, including its surviving navy, to remain within a series of fixed boundaries across the galaxy. But the surrender of military equipment and the internment of warships should have been a key aspect of any peace treaty. By allowing the Imperial Navy to remain in operation, albeit within a rump state, the Republic squandered a massive opportunity to not only demilitarize the Imperial Remnant, but to incorporate its own enormous institutional knowledge into their own forces. Had the New Republic instead demanded that the Imperial Starfleet be split across the galaxy, manned by skeleton crews, and then either scrapped or pressed into Republic service, the flight of Imperial veterans into the unknown regions would have been considerably more difficult and would have set back any attempt at rearmament by decades. A strong military-industrial complex was one of the defining aspects of the Galactic Empire, and it is entirely reasonable to dismantle such an apparatus when transitioning to a democratic government. This however should have taken place over at least a few decades. Instead. The Military Disarmament Act was passed even before the final peace treaty had been signed, before the galaxy had been stabilized, and before the galactic economy could adjust, weakening the Republic's bargaining position at a time when it needed it most. This mistake is compounded by the fact that creating a new form of government and the institutions to run it doesn't happen overnight, especially in a galaxy comprised of tens of thousands of inhabited star systems and various political factions attempting to take advantage of the situation, not to mention a well-developed underworld and a substantial criminal element. Occupying major worlds with Republic soldiers might not have been a popular choice, but it would have proven to the galaxy that the Republic existed outside of the walls of the Senate and is capable of projecting and defending its sovereignty. In the prelude to the Clone Wars, galactic corporations were afforded far too much power and influence, to the point where they could compete with the Galactic Republic and impose their own dominion across multiple star systems. While such conglomerates were largely abolished by the Galactic Empire, key industries were subject to heavy government regulation and existed largely to serve the state and the military. Such industries were massively impacted by the fall of the Empire, and the Republic's reluctance to engage in even the barest of military spending encouraged these massive industries to begin supporting rival regimes, rather than undertake the massive financial investment of transitioning into the civilian sector. Had the Republic nationalized key industries, and forced Kuat and Trala and others to build tractors and refrigerators, instead of somehow clandestinely building Star Destroyers, the New Republic wouldn't have lost its military superiority to the First Order so quickly. All the various forms of the Republic that have existed across the ages share a generally decentralized nature. Planets and systems are free to manage their own affairs as they see fit, and the Republic intervenes only sporadically. While this approach might work during an era of extended peace, during times of chaos, a planet or system's allegiance to the Republic might vary wildly across the galaxy. Sullust, for example, might see themselves as Sullustans first and members of the Republic second. The rebellion before it was built on hope, but with nothing to replace it once hope was no longer needed, there seemed to be little left to bind its members together. The rebellion was united because of an external enemy, and in turn became too dependent on that enemy to survive. The rebellion, and later the New Republic, detested Imperial rule to such an extent 
that when building their new government, they essentially did the exact opposite of the empire whenever possible. A centralized bureaucracy, powerful state offices, a well-financed military, these are not inherently bad things, and might have even been necessary for the Republic to survive. Unfortunately, the overriding theme in the actions of the Republic is that they deemed anything remotely associated with the Empire to be incompatible with the New Republic. One of the primary characteristics of a state is the ability of the governing body to exercise supreme authority over its own affairs, without interference from outside sources. Of all the major galactic powers in history, only the Empire truly achieved this, and the Republic was too scared to even try. The Templin Institute investigates nations, organizations, and factions from alternate worlds and realities. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Do you have a suggestion for a future episode? Let us know by leaving a comment.